What's going on guys? Welcome back to the Electro Fly YouTube channel. Today we're going to be rebuilding some monotube internal floating piston shocks. Now if that just sounded like Chinese to you, don't worry. I have a solution. I'm going to teach you guys all about it coming up right now. Alrighty guys, welcome back. So today, as stated before, we're gonna be rebuilding some shocks. Now these are some Fox Podium 1.5s. Uh, they're actually for my dad's quad. These are actually off of a 850X MR. This is what comes standard on them. I actually picked these guys up for $100 shipped off Facebook Marketplace. Screaming deal. Two of them were blown, rebuilt them already, and now I'm just going through and rebuilding the ones that aren't blown, just because they all have the same miles on them. Now one disclaimer is that I don't rebuild shocks as my profession, so this is just something I do as a hobby for fun, so take my advice with a grain of salt. I'm not a professional, I'm gonna do my best I can to explain how I do it and what works for me. So if you have any doubts, make sure you send it out to your favorite shock rebuilder and get it done probably by them, but I assure you that the way I do it will work and get you back on a trail. All right, so as I stated in the intro, we're gonna start with the first part of it, and that's that this is a monotube shock. So this is a monotube shock. This is a monotube shock. This is a monotube shock also. So they all look kind of different. They all got different shapes and sizes and everything, but they're all the same because they all are monotube. Now you're also gonna see some shocks that are called twin tube shocks um, that have a piggyback reservoir. So this way you have some uh, extra fluid and whatnot. Much more high performance shocks will be um, to a twin tube. Some have external reservoirs where they're connected by a tube. So some pretty cool stuff. All right, so an internal floating piston shock. What does that mean? Because it's a bunch of gibberish, right? But it's actually gonna be a really important thing um, that you have to know when it comes to rebuilding one of these shocks. So basically, um, there's two different chambers inside this monotube here. So um, kind of like up here, I'd say, is probably where this guy is, somewhere around here. There is a divider that's your internal flow and piston or IFP, that's how we're gonna be referring it to. Um, and it separates your gas chamber, which is back here, from all the oil that's in this section here. Basically both work together into making how your, your suspension works as far as your compression and rebound and all that stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of different pressures we're gonna go over. But basically that's a very important thing you have to know when it comes to rebuilding your shock. And uh, Carver Performance seems to be like the number one site to go to. You can go right on there, download their PDF file they have, and they have tons of shocks. So they got Articat shocks like this, the ACT series. And they got Fox shocks. They do a bunch of different brands and everything. So, and they got the rebuild kits too. So you can just, once you find out what rebuild kit you need, just grab it. So to get into rebuilding shocks, you are going to need some special tools, but don't worry, they pay for themselves in the long run. Uh, some can be a little expensive. I'd say pay for the better ones. Don't get some cheap thing off eBay. It might work for a couple times, but you want something that's going to last. So I actually picked up this guy. This guy was uh, like 150 bucks, but this is a needle tool. So basically, this is how we're going to be getting the nitrogen in and out of the gas chamber of the shock. So um, these, these come in different lengths. Um, I got a long one because it seems to work with most shocks I have laying around. There are short needles. Um, those ones work good for like if you're just doing something like these Articat shocks where nitrogen just goes in right there, super easy. So another thing you're gonna need, unfortunately, because obviously you just saw I have a nitrogen tool, you're gonna need nitrogen. So nitrogen, um, when you buy a bottle, usually the bottle itself costs a lot, but don't worry, because once you buy the bottle, you just have to recharge it, and usually it recharges like 20, 30 bucks, something like that. It's not that expensive. Luckily for me, I do HVAC, so I have nitrogen around all the time for what I do. So I have a bottle down here, and basically you're gonna want, you need a regulator with some kind of hose that can at least handle up to like 1,000 PSI. Mine handles up to 300 PSI. We're just gonna pretend we didn't see that. Um, and then also you're just gonna want some kind of like air, air truck on there as well. That's how you charge going right back into here. Another thing you're gonna wanna grab is some shock assembly grease. This stuff I got from Carver as well. Works really good. Um, they actually sent me two for some reason. I only ordered one. 
Don't know why. And the last thing you need is a shock oil. There are tons of different flavors of this stuff. I just went with Fox stuff because I am dealing with some Fox shocks today. But um, there are other brands that make shock fluid and also you have different viscosities. So make sure you put the right stuff in your shocks. See what your shock requires. Um, using Fox, I know it's gonna be good for a Fox shock, uh, but make sure you grab the right stuff for yours. Now another tool that comes in handy is gonna be a small pick, something that's actually kind of sharp. This is actually, again, something I use for work. It's a yellow jacket over and repl replacement tool, funny enough. Um, but it's got a really nice pick end on it that works really good for getting the seals and stuff out for the shock. So um, those are the main tools that you might not have laying around that you're gonna need. Now, other tools that you're gonna need is some way of measuring that IFP depth. So going back to our internal floating piston, um, you're gonna need some kind of way of measuring the depth of that guy when we go to reassemble the shock. So I just usually use a tape measure. You can use a dowel caliper, a couple different tools you can use. I just happen to use a tape measure. It does the job for me and it seems to work every time. So finally, let's get into the part of the video you've probably been waiting for, and that's actually taking this sucker apart so we can actually see what we're dealing with inside. All right, so we have our shock mounted in the vise. Uh, having a vise around is gonna be a big help because it can hold the thing still because sometimes if you're trying to get off like one of these, um, it's called the bearing cap. Um, trying to get off one of these guys here, could be a lot of fun because this is a style where you'd have to actually use a, a big crescent wrench to get that guy off there. Now, with this one, it's actually a hammer off style bearing cap. So first things first, before we start taking the shock apart, we're gonna wanna clean things up. So I got this, this shock pretty clean. I used just some, some gas, funny enough. You're gonna want it pretty clean, especially um, where the needle's gonna be going in and then also where you're gonna be working up by the seals and stuff like that. Now, sometimes when you go to rebuild a shock, they're still charged with nitrogen. And what the nitrogen does is it helps uh, rebound the shock when it compresses. So in this instance, we push it down, shock comes back up. So that means we still have a nitrogen charge in this guy. I don't know if it's the full amount, that's a 300 PSI for this one, um, but there is some in there. So if you start just trying to take things apart, you're gonna blow some fluid in your face and you're also gonna possibly hurt yourself. So first thing we're gonna do, is actually go ahead and discharge that nitrogen. So what I did is I took the Schrader out of the back of the nitrogen tool here. So now I'm just gonna go show you guys on the bench here. You should be able to see it in this camera. I'm just gonna clamp her into the vise. And go ahead and insert the needle. And there we hear our air coming out. So wait till you hear it all come out, because sometimes it takes a second. So now if we press down on the shock, it should act like a dead shock. Now you guys might already have a dead shock because it could have lost its nitrogen again, or it might not even have any oil in it. Bad shock, but you can see a way just push down way too easy. And yeah, nothing's really going on here. She's, actually the only reason it compressed up is because there's air now in there. But yeah, she's, she's not doing anything for us, which is awesome. So now, we're gonna go ahead and actually start disassembling this. All right, so on this style shock, um, in order to get the bearing cap off, we actually just have to use a flat blade screwdriver and a hammer to remove it. Now, doing this, this is just aluminum, so you wanna be careful not to score it up too much. It's gonna happen a little bit, unfortunately, but they do sell a tool for us, but it's really hard to come by. So using a flat tip screwdriver and a hammer, it's gonna get the job done for us. All right, so the easiest thing to do is just come in here, give her a couple Love ties, you might have to hit it pretty good. Now you just wanna be careful not to also hit the shaft there that I almost just did myself. Uh, otherwise you can accidentally score the shaft and then it's never gonna seal correctly ever again. But there you go, popped off. You can see we got some lovely dirt in there. Not gonna worry about cleaning it up too much right now because yeah, we're gonna be cleaning this all up in a minute. So next thing we're gonna wanna do is there is a, a ring in here that holds this guy and that's what's holding in basically the whole assembly at this point. So we're just gonna take our pick, push down on this guy a little bit, get the pick in there. Now be careful not to mar up the walls of the shock, doing any kind of use with the pick and whatnot. And just gonna work this guy all the way out if we can. There we go, that rings out. And now we can go ahead and pull apart the shock. All right, so if you notice over here, I actually have just a nice clean, pretty clean, <laughs> uh, pretty clean paper towel set up here. Um, you're gonna wanna do this uh, for this next step because this is where we're gonna start disassembling a lot of stuff like shims and all kinds of other stuff. You're gonna wanna make sure 
that you don't lose anything and you're going to want to make sure that everything stays in order. I'll show you what I'm talking about with order here in a second. So first things first, let's go ahead and take that out. That came out way easier than I thought. <laughs> All right, so it's making some weird noises for some reason. <laughs> but the oil is disgusting looking in this, so sure enough, it was due for a rebuild. And for whatever reason, it's smoking. Okay. But I'm going to go ahead and just dry this off a little bit real quick with some paper towels just so we can set this off to the side and not get oil everywhere. You can actually see this shock had a lot of heat in it. See how it's all red like that? This thing's seen some torture on the trail. No biggie. We're going to get that every, everything all cleaned up here shortly. So we're going to set that down. Now, next thing we have to do is just discard of our nasty old oil. I'm just gonna dump it in my uh, oil reclaim stuff. That goes down to uh, like AutoZone or whatever. They usually take oil, pretty nice of them. All right, so the next step here is to remove the internal floating piston. Now this gets a little sketchy, I'm not gonna lie, this is how I do it. They sell actual tools for it per shock, but to be honest, if you're doing multiple different kinds of shocks and stuff like that, you literally have to have a internal floating piston removal tool for every shock you have because everyone's a little bit different, I've come to find out. So the easiest way to get them out is with air. So we're not gonna jump to the nitrogen just yet because why waste it? We can just use regular compressed air to remove it. So how we're gonna do that is we're gonna put our Schrader back in to our nitrogen tool here. And go ahead and get that all set up. Now you're gonna want a pretty thick towel here. I usually just kind of hold it like so. And this is to catch the internal flowing piston while it comes out. And there's going to be a lot of pressure behind it, so that's why you want to use a thick towel so you don't blow your hand off. Here we go. You kind of hear it trying to go. There she is. All right. See that? Didn't blow my hand off. Good day. Good day. almost dead. <laughs> Alright, so here is our internal floating piston. So this is what actually separates the uh, nitrogen charge that goes in the, in the um, I guess you could say the top of the shock, bottom of the shock, depends on how it's installed. Um, but this is what separates the nitrogen charge from the oil that goes in the shock. So one thing I like to do when I order a shock rebuild kit, like this one here, is I like to get the one that has the most parts with it. So replace everything I can while I'm in there, just because why do we are already in there? Why skip out on a couple O-rings or seals and stuff like that? So this kit from Carver actually even came with the uh, internal floating piston, a brand new one, which is really cool. So really nice thing to have. All right, so now that we got our internal floating piston out of the shock, next thing we're gonna wanna do is there's some residual, this nasty oil in there. Um, it's still pretty clean in there, believe it or not, but there's this, I just know it's on the side of the walls. So one thing we're gonna do, I just already did this off camera, but I'll just do it again for you guys, is I have a rag zip tied to a metal rod. Now, one thing you wanna be careful of doing um, this is not to accidentally go through the rag and make sure the metal does not hit the inner walls of the shock. You wanna keep this shock as nice as you can on the um, side walls and everything because that's just gonna ensure that it's gonna work really good. So, in nice and smooth. Try not to hit on anything. I usually do like a little spinny action here. And there you go, just like that. She's all nice and clean. All right, so now that our shock's nice and clean, um, we're just gonna set this guy actually off to the side for a little bit, because now comes the fun part where we start replacing some seals and some O-rings and stuff. All right, so here's the main shaft assembly. I'm not huge on terms of what all this stuff is, but this is where all the action happens. Good enough, right? All right, so you'll see when you pull the shock out, one of these guys might come out. So basically from what I've seen uh, rebuilding shocks, is this guy kind of keeps the fluid running through the valving of the shock and not just passing by it. It also makes it obviously, keeps everything nice and smooth going up and down. Um, so this way the metal uh, piston here doesn't just mar up the walls of the inside of the shock. So right now we're just gonna move, go ahead and take this guy off of here. All right, just like that. Now we're actually gonna place everything in a vise because this is where it gets a little bit of fun. Now this part is very important to have, like I said, a nice clean rag or workspace. Don't look at my bench, it's very dirty right now. So in my instance, we have a 916 nut. 
Um, it's pretty cool. The Carver K actually comes with a new nut and everything because this is a locking style nut. So we're just going to go ahead and remove that guy. They're pretty tight usually, so it goes on real tight when you go to take or uh, put it back together. Now this is the next step I'm, you got to be on your game with. Everything you take off, put in order because if you accidentally miss uh, mess up these shims, your shock will not perform at all like it used to. It'll actually be very bad because now your your compression rebounds all going to be all out of whack. So I basically just go from left to right, taking stuff off. So I start with the nut. Now we have a washer on the top here. Boom. Put that guy next. Then we have the entire top stack of shims here. Now this, these guys are pretty clean, so I'm not gonna disassemble them. I'm just gonna um, clean it off with a rag and then put it back on when we're done. I have taken apart shocks where this stuff's all grimy and nasty and stuff, where it's blown, uh, everything's blown up. When you take apart the shims, you're gonna wanna do one at a time and just make sure you do the clockwise rotation there. Now, here is the actual um, piston that directs the flow of oil. So this guy, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to how it comes off because for like in this instance, you'll see that side, the holes here protrude a little bit. Whereas on this side, it has larger holes, holes that protrude. So I know just from rebuilding the other three that the larger holes go down. So I'm gonna set that downwards so I know that's how it goes. And here's your bottom shim stack with some washers and stuff. Like I said, I'm not taking them apart, but sometimes if you do have grime in here, you're gonna wanna do that to clean everything up nice because, I mean, you're already in here. You want everything to be good. Now we're taking off this guy here. Careful not to scratch up your shaft. And here's the bearing cap that is shot. And then for fun, we're also just gonna be taking off the bumper and the lower washer. So we're just left with literally just the shaft. So the reason I'm doing this is because we're gonna be cleaning everything. So I have a parts washer. I'm gonna go ahead, clean up all these parts and catch you guys in a minute when everything's nice and clean. All right, so basically how I like to do things is um, work my way back to reassembling here. So I got the shaft all cleaned up, um, got the bottom washer. Actually, we'll just throw that back on real quick. This is the bottom washer that holds, it's for the, uh, the bumper here. There we go. Now you'll see a bunch of dirt, even though I just cleaned that came off. That's why it's really important to keep everything nice and clean while you're doing this. So keep an eye on stuff, make sure everything stays nice and clean. All right, so now we have the bottom cap that goes in the shock. So this is gonna go on next. We have our first seal we have to get out. So what I usually like to do, got your pick, get right in here. It can be a little bit of a pain in the butt sometimes. Get underneath of it and give her the beans. This one's really stuck in there. Usually come out easier than this. There she goes, so got it started. Pulling it out, you can see there. And basically just, now we're left with this, but you can see this is all nasty looking. We need to clean this up. So we're gonna go ahead. I usually like to make a pile of all my old seals and O-rings and everything, just to make sure everything stays nice. So I'm gonna go ahead, clean this all up, make this look brand new again. All right, so we got it all cleaned up really nice, you can see. Looks pretty dang near new. There's a little bit of staining on there from the dirt that was on here, but biggest thing is making sure that the inner pocket here and everything where the actual seal sits is all nice and clean. Now, next thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna go ahead and get our shock assembly grease out. So this stuff I also got off Carver Performance. It's gonna take a little bit, put in our new seal here that I forgot to take out. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw a little bit of the assembly lube on here. On the inside and the outside, just go ahead and coat it pretty good. And we're gonna go ahead and reinstall. So for this guy, here's the outside of it. The little crown piece is gonna to go to the outside. So it's basically, it's a little bit hard to show on camera, unfortunately, but just start tucking it in. She'll kind of fall into place, just like so. Now, next thing you wanna do is just clean this all off, or clean off some of the excess grease because you don't want that getting all over everything. And we can slide that guy onto the shaft. All right, so when putting the uh, cap back on, make sure you're very careful because this can be a little bit sharp. You don't want to damage your new shaft. That's why I like to grease that. Just when I first put it on, you're not getting um, 
what do you call it? you're not going to risk damaging it and then try to push it down as evenly as you can all the way down to the bottom to get it out of your way um, don't shimmy it down or anything like that because they you're just going to destroy your brand new seal all right next thing we got this guy here so same deal so this actually has an o-ring on the outside but also has a seal on the inside so o-ring comes off super simple just gonna peel that guy off again we have another seal in here you might be able to see it on camera but this is where your pick comes in handy now try not to mar up the metal in here too much when you're picking because you can destroy some stuff i usually just try to hook right into the rubber and pull it out and there you go this got that guy out you always want to make sure also when you're pulling things out they pay attention to which way they came out because the old seal has to go back in that way so let me get this guy cleaned up and then i'll show you how we reassemble this one all right so this guy got everything all cleaned up so i put more uh, assembly lube on here and when i did the o-ring and also some on the seal as well i usually like to do that again because when you're sliding it back onto the shaft here um don't want anything to uh get tore or anything like that so i'm gonna go nice and gently here Let's keep it nice and straight. There you go. All the way down to the bottom, out of the way, done. All right, so now we get to putting our valving back on. Like I said, hopefully you just didn't lose all your parts and drop it or something like that, because you know, I've done that before. Luckily I had the same shocks laying around, so I was able to, it was two rears, able to copy the valving. So I'm gonna go ahead and just clean these guys off real quick. Just wipe them with a rag, trying to separate them. There we go. And so it kind of just falls back into place. Right, so now we got this guy here. This is what helps control the flow of the oil and um, shoots the oil basically through the shim stacks. That's where you get your compression and rebound. Now changing out these shims and stuff to different sizes, different thicknesses, that's how you actually do uh, valving adjustments and stuff, which is really cool. Um, we're not doing any of that obviously, but it's a cool thing to kind of check out while you're in there and, and whatnot. A lot of pro shock shops can actually uh, revalve shocks usually for you for your needs or whatever you want. Um, but this guy actually has an O-ring on it, so O-ring part had those two backwards. <laughs> but it's going to change this O-ring out now. Again, adding a little bit of lube to everything. All right, so like I said, I remember how this guy came off here. Now, for this particular shock, I don't know if it matters or not. Again, not a shock expert. So the way the top um, shim is for the valve stack here, um, you can see the marks on it where this guy was sitting. But as you also see, there's some notches in it too. So pay close attention to that because I'm gonna be putting it back the same way like that. So they line up with each other because there's probably a reason why it's aligned like that. So this way the oil passes through there properly. So got that guy back on. This is our upper stack here. I said it didn't take it apart in this instance. I kind of do the same thing. This one doesn't have any notches or anything cut into it like the other one did, but still want to uh, go ahead and kind of place them roughly where they were like that. There you go. Perfect. And then the top washer here, boom. And then we have a new nut. So might as well use the new nut because we're already at it. Now these are tightened pretty tight. Usually that's all I do. Seems to work pretty good for me. You're pretty dang snug. So now we got this whole assembly basically rebuilt. The only thing we're not waiting to do is to uh, put this guy in. I'll show you how to do that when we go to reassemble because um, it's a lot easier than doing it externally. So right now we're gonna set this aside and bring back out the actual body of the shock. All right, so got the body of our shock. It's all cleaned up from before. Everything looks nice and good in there. It gave us some time to dry after cleaning it up. Everything looks really nice. All right, so now we're gonna get into the portion of installing our internal floating piston back in here. Now, some guys, there's different ways guys do this from what I've seen on forums and stuff like that. Uh, some guys now, they just uh, say, oh, about um, set the internal piston um, into about like one third of the way and then two thirds of the way is gonna be your oil and whatnot. I just go by the manufacturer specs. Um, seems to work good for me. So the specs we're gonna be looking at are going to be uh, right off of Carver's uh, website. They said they got that really nice PDF. All right, so real quick on my phone here, I have in my notepad for this shock, um, actually I have the whole section, I just literally copy and pasted it. I actually have the part number for the rebuild kit, which is 
or sorry, it's a 11-0221. Two, two, two. It's a lot of twos and ones. Um, but they're saying they want the IFP, the internal floating piston, to be set at 8.2 inches. So we're going to go ahead and do just that. So 8.2 is roughly eight and a quarter. For somewhere around there, we're safe. It doesn't have to be right on. Now, some guys want to set it right on. You can do that We're using a dial cop or whatever. I'm basically going to set this for right around eight and a quarter-ish, a little less than eight and a quarter, and then that should be perfect for this guy. All right, so I got my internal floating piston all lubed up. So now we're going to go ahead and take our nitrogen tool here, and we're going to remove the schrader out of it because we want air to come out super easy. And then we're just going to insert it here. You actually hear some air release. And then what I usually do, I just use a wood handle of a my rubber mallet here, basically. And just gonna tap it in to roughly kind of where we gotta head towards. So as you start pushing in, you hear some air coming out. You'll actually feel it compressing back at you a little bit too. Just kind of keep trying to push it in. Let it do its thing. All right. Now we'll start double checking to see how we're doing. Now when checking the depth, try not to scratch the walls of the uh, body here too much. Unfortunately, you're gonna to touch it a little bit. It's hard to be perfect. So I'm at roughly eight right now, so we're really close. So I'm just going to give it a love tap here, kind of look at the mallet, see where I'm at. That feels like roughly a quarter-ish ish inch. Boom, there's eight and a quarter. When I measure it, I basically measure right to the edge of the shock here. All right, so I now have this guy set at eight and a quarter for the IFP. That's roughly where we want to be. So now we're gonna go ahead and stand our shock up and now comes the fun part and that is filling the thing up with some fluid. So for this Fox shock, I went with the Fox flavor. So I got this right off of Carver's website. Went with their R2 high performance suspension fluid. So we're gonna go ahead, I'm gonna fill this most of the way up, probably about two inches from the top off, I'm gonna say. And there's the fluid. Now, when it, putting all this in, you're gonna see that some oil might come out at you. So, but, all right, so this is where this piece of paper deal comes in, cardboard, whatever it might be. I'm not exactly sure. I said, not professional, I don't do this stuff every day. We're just gonna refold it around, kind of like the one that came out of there was. We're just gonna fold it around. And here's where it gets a little tricky. You kind of have to walk it in to the shock gently now. Now in doing this, I go really slow because you don't want to push this ramrod it down in because A, you can see there's no stability yet here because this guy is not pushed down yet. Um, so I go really slow because the other reason is you can actually push the fluid so hard that you can actually push that IFP down and it's gonna throw off your the whole measurement you just did. So I just go nice and lightly till I start getting some fluid out the top. Right there, seems to be good. Top it off with a little bit more fluid. We always wanna make sure you leave a little bit of room for the cap here. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and start to get this thing into its final stages. So we're gonna slide this guy back down, like so. There she goes, stuck on there. There we go. Just wanna go gently, get our retaining ring back in here. He just clicks right in, boom, boom. Now you're gonna see there's a little bit of slop in because the IFP might move a little bit. Slide the main cap down. We're just gonna take our hammer and slightly, gently tap it back in. Works a little bit better with a ball peen. Make sure it's sitting completely flush all the way around because if it's crooked, you're gonna blow that seal basically immediately when you go out on a trail because it's gonna be crooked. All right, just like that, it's done. No, it's not. We have more work to do. So don't go pushing on it now and stuff like that. I know it's exciting. You just got your shock all redone. done. Don't go do that yet because now we have to actually nitrogen charge this thing. So it's basically the reverse of how we let it all out except now we're gonna be using nitrogen to fill it. Now, again, on Carver's website, on that lovely PDF they have, 
they have the factory charge of what belongs in these shocks. These guys actually take a whopping 300 PSI, which is actually one of the higher ones. Usually they're right around 150, 200. These guys are pretty stout. So got my nitrogen tank over here. I'm gonna set her for roughly right around like 320 actually, because it, I found it goes in way easier. And you can actually reach your number of 300 that you're trying to achieve. We gotta put the Schrader back in a tool and we're gonna start filling this thing up. All right, well here comes the fun part. So we're gonna go ahead and insert the tool, insert the needle. Boom, there we go. Now some guys pull vacuum on the shock. I don't necessarily do that. I usually just make sure there's no air left in it. And then we're gonna go ahead and start filling with nitrogen. Now the gauge is gonna tell us exactly how much is in there. So like I said, we're looking for 300 with this guy. There's 250. Let's take a couple hits. There's like 275. All right, just like that, we got 300. Very good. And then pull this guy out really fast so you don't lose much air, much nitrogen rather. Now you don't want to use this regular air because um, it's not very stable regular air. But here's the magic test. So we're going to go ahead and push down. Feels like we got really good compression. Rebound looks awesome. There you go. Shock is rebuilt. And just like that folks, the shock is rebuilt. Uh, thing came out really good and it's a super easy job to do. I might've made it more complicated than it actually is. Just to show you guys some extra steps to make sure that you guys do it properly. I said, this is the way I do it. It might not necessarily be the correct way of doing it. Now, if you have some doubts about rebuilding a shock, definitely just send it to your local shock professional. The other thing they can do for you that I can do is actually throw this on a shock dyno and they can actually see how the shock's performing and see how it's doing compared to what its stock results should be. So they can actually make sure the valving still looks good, see if the shims need replacing, and they can also do some custom valving for you as well. Um, so this way the shocks are dialed in for your riding style and your rider weight, all that fun stuff. So with that, make sure you guys are liking, subscribing, and commenting down below. We really appreciate everything you guys do. If you are a professional shock rebuilder and have some suggestions, make sure you leave it in the comment section down below and I'll pin it so this way other viewers can see it. Now if you wanna catch some behind the scenes action for other stuff we're doing and whatnot, make sure you head on over to our Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, and we will have to catch you guys next time on Let There Fly. Have you forgotten?